Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Sam, and I serve as the assistant pastor here at Arise Church. Um, and I'm excited. I get the honor to launch us into this new teaching series, If the Church Knew. It comes out of that question. If the church really knew uh, I was walking with this, or I experienced this, um, what would they say? What would they do? How would they treat me? And it comes out of a question of things that people experience every day. Um, and so if you're here and you raised your hand uh, and did the wave, you're an everyday person. And so these are things you walk around with. And these are things that the people on your left and right walk around with. And these are the things uh, that the people in our places of work or in our schools and our community walk around with. And so we are going to dive into these different topics. We're talking about uh, mental health, uh, struggling with faith, uh, addiction, uh, abortion, same-sex attraction, uh, the, the everyday life things of people. Man, what would the church do? What if the church knew? How would they respond is a big question. And this is uh, topics that sometimes is difficult to get into because they're nuanced. Uh, They're a little bit messy. They're not something really you can tie up really neat in a bow and like give it to somebody. It's, It's a lot harder. And so life is complicated, right? I mean, this is my analogy of how complicated something can get. Okay, you ready? This is gonna stress some people. This is a beer, I know I've seen pastors drink water while they preach. I've seen them drink co- tea. I've seen them drink coffee. But I don't think I've ever seen a pastor drink a beer and preach. So don't worry this morning. I'm not going to do that for you thought that if that's where this was going. But this little thing packs a lot of maybe nuance and controversy, just one little beer. Because does the people, the space, the timing of when or how that beer gets I don't know, consumed matter? And it's, what do you guys think? I'm pretty sure if I drink it right now, I might lose my job. So (laughs) I think it matters. That's pretty wild. That thing contains a lot of potency. And then uh, if that's, it's got a lot of power sitting right there. It's just sitting right there doing nothing. Yet uh, it, it holds kind of our attention. But there's nuance to it, right? It would be the meanest, jerkest thing I could do um, to offer some to, uh, say, uh, an alcoholic in recovery. Be like, yeah, you want some, man? That would be, so you'd be like, what are you doing? That would be a jerk move to do. It wouldn't be um, hard to figure that out. Uh, but there's other spaces that it becomes complicated to walk out. We can ask questions. We, ask, we look at scripture for verses. I think the, uh, when talking about alcohol, everyone talks about uh, Ephesians 5, 18, which says, uh, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You guys, this is very, everyone knows we're talking about that. But for this beer, I would talk about Proverb, probably Proverbs 31, 6 and 7. Anybody listen to a message on Proverbs 31, 6, and 7 recently? No? All right. It essentially says, and I'm paraphrasing, look it up yourself, give alcohol to those who are dying and in agony. Look at, context matters, go read the verse, but it, it says that, and you go, what is happening in there? And you can go and look at scripture and wrestle. See, for me, there's a lot of nuance in this specific beer. Some of you guys, we just read the verse on judging, right? And some of you guys judge me that I have a hams beer with me and not something else, okay? So, so it, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so some context to this, though. Um, this beer means a lot to me. Uh, this past summer, I lost my grandpa. And his nickname uh, in the Marines as a young man was Johnny Hams. Now, if that isn't a villain in, like, a teen beach movie, I don't know what is. Like, here comes Johnny Hams in the gang, right? His nickname was Johnny Hams because every time they went to a watering hole or bar, he consumed Hams beer. So I kind of want to drink a beer in honor of my grandpa. His name is my middle name. He is someone who shaped and formed me. His legacy is something I'm trying to build on. It is, like, a grieving process. Even just talking about... Some silly as ham's beer brings me back to that. It's messy. 
It's complicated. Like, but isn't that what life is? And so when we look at all these topics and issues, I'm going to go put this away so you stop staring at it. Um, uh, and so when you dive into topics that are complicated, um, that require some nuance, often we like to shy away from it because it's easier just to try and ignore it. And it's easier to pretend it's not happening, it's not here. Uh, but all these different topics we're going to get into, they're real life, everyday things. And we need to know what the Word of God says on this stuff. If uh, We're going to engage with it. But this isn't uh, Pastor Sam's idea. This isn't Pastor Joel's idea. This is actually from the words of Jesus in Matthew 7 that we just read. Uh, if you want to put that verse up. That Jesus is saying, like, look, uh, if it's not a don't you dare judge me type of statement. This is... Uh, People like to probably misuse this verse in a, don't you judge me or you're going to get judged in a, like a self-righteous, I can do what I want. Uh, and they forget to read the rest of what Jesus said there. But in context, Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to live in right relationship with other people and walk around with trying to figure out what's right and good and fair in the world, you get better check your eyes for some blind spots especially some big ones. I think Jesus is kind of being hilarious, you know, this giant log, and like, he's being ridiculous on purpose to show us just how silly that is. It's a log in our eye, and as a church, uh, as individuals, we got to wrestle with what are our blind spots that come to these topics? What are the painful things impacting our vision that we cannot see that's impacting how we see and how we approach this kind of stuff? And Jesus is saying, well, we got to remove it. And this is going to be some hard work that Jesus is inviting us in to do. So all these topics are not for, uh, as we preach and look at what God's word says, it's not for people out there. This is for us in here as we wrestle out what God says and to let uh, the word of God show us ourselves. I love what James says when he says, all right, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. But to be a doer of the word, you actually have to look at the word of God. And he compared it to like looking in a mirror. And I love how he adds, if you pull up the James verse, that he says you got to like persevere. You know why do you have to persevere when you're looking at a mirror like that? It's easy to look at a mirror uh, when you have it all together and it's really beautiful you can just be like, yeah, I got it going on. It's exciting. It doesn't take a lot of a perseverance to look at yourself when you're happy with what you look like. It takes perseverance to look at yourself, God's perfect law, and go, ooh, the reflection coming back at me, it ain't so pretty. It's got some things in it I'm not, I don't know if I like looking at. But if we want to become doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, we got to look at it and actually have it look at ourselves and re have it reveal to us our deficiencies, our, the logs that are in our eye. And that's where we're going with in this series. And this is hard work. This is not for uh, the light-hearted. This will take some deep uh, intentionality work. And so uh, we cannot spend a half hour on a Sunday morning with each subject and be like, bam, we got it as a church. We figured it out. Everyone else is confused and we have it. This is going to take us um, journeying together and not just from the series, but moving forward, learning how do we walk with this stuff. So that is where we're starting. So I'm going to pray because we got to put this stuff in its proper place and submit this to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we need you. We need you uh, to come reveal the things in our hearts. Lord, we just sang, open the eyes of our heart. We want to see you. Uh, we want to see you move with power and glory. We want to see your kingdom come. And we know when we pray and we ask that, we're asking you to start with us. So would you come and show us the things maybe we need to repent of? Would you come and show us uh, the places where maybe we need encouragement? Would you come and show us what we need so that we may be doers of your word, that we may live out this good news that we have received from you, Lord. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, and this morning, may this be uh, your words and not mine. Would you hide me behind the cross, Lord? And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so they gave me mental health. A couple, well, it's a couple months ago now, I asked some teenagers about mental health. And 
essentially, this is what they told me. We don't know what mental health is. No one's really told us what mental health is, but we've been told we're bad at it. I'm like, man, isn't that self-fulfilling prophecy right there? That you're bad at mental health, but we're not really sure what mental health is. So right away, uh, when you walk down the journey of mental health, uh, mental health is a man-made secular term to try and give language to the things that are inside of us as a human being. All right? Does that, does that kind of make sense? Because this is going to get pretty messy, so I need you to bob your head sometimes <laughs> in case, just so I, I, know I, I, don't, I don't lose you. Uh, if I lose you, you know, really, like, I don't know, get my attention or something like that. I don't know. Um, but it's going to be kind of sticky. So it's man-made language to try and figure out the inside of a human being, uh, some of the soft, soft sick, sticky um, things uh, that are taking place uh, in our world. And it's not hard to find uh, articles, books, research um, of what's happening in our current society, our culture, uh, of what's happening with mental health. So, I mean, check this out. All right, we're going to do a little poll. Uh, I need you to raise your hand if you think, uh, here in, we'll just do Shaboy again, we're not even going to go that wide. We are doing great at mental health. All right, we got Don. All right, just raise your hand if you think we're doing okay with mental health things. A couple more hands. Who thinks uh, we're doing not very good with mental health? Okay, look at that. All right, so it doesn't take long. I don't have to go find some research. You guys are, you know, did that for me. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's bigger than just uh, a couple of people. Um, and it's worth not just us as a church asking this. I really believe us as a, maybe a country, as a society, as people, we have some other questions we need to probably start asking each other. Um, but we're not doing that today. We're asking us as a church. Because for us as a church who live in Sheboygan uh, County, we are not immune to its effect. And if we're not asking the right questions, we're not going to be paying attention to these things and how it's impacting us. And so if we're going to be uh, people who engage with it, um, we, need, we need to ask some, quest- some good questions and wrestle with it. Um, mental health, when you start to study, what, it, what does the Bible say on it? What do Christian authors or people who study this for a living do a really good job? Um, there's a disagreement on even how to approach mental health. So I'm like, okay, that's not even that helpful. Um, there's camps, and within those camps, there's sub-camps, and it just kind of uh, gets really messy really fast. And so this has been something that's uh, really since mental health is a word has come around around, the, I don't know, the 80s. I was before I was born. Apparently that's when some of this started to take shape and conversations like this took place. And so instead of just trying to say, here's a really neat package definition of what mental health is, I'm going to try and give us a picture, an analogy of what it is. Um, so that way we can kind of walk together on some common foot. Uh, so this is the best analogy picture I can do for mental health. All right, you ready? This past fall, I was on a run. Uh, sometimes I process stuff with God. And uh, I'm coming up to an intersection, and the car that uh, was coming up to the stop sign just slams on the brakes. I'm talking the screeching halt. The driver looks like they get whiplash. And so I'm like, oh, my goodness. Pull up my earbud. I'm like, I mouth the words, are you okay? And the driver doesn't seem to react, so I was like, okay, maybe they just hit the brakes too hard, not that big a deal, all right. Put my earbud in, start walking, and then the car follows me, pulls over to the right, and uh, again, with the big screech and herky-jerky stop, and I pull my earbud, I'm like, are you all right? And uh, I can see it's a lady, and the wipers are going, the hazards are on. She eventually gets the window to go down. She says, no, I'm not doing all right. And then I was like, okay. Like, I'm like, all right, now i got to engage with this, apparently. And she starts uh, talking about this isn't her car, this is her uncle's car, or something like that, and she just starts exploding. And then she opens her door and gets out. Now she's in the street, and she's, like, losing her marbles, just talking about stuff. I'm like, okay, like, now this is dangerous because you're in the middle of the road. So I step in, and I go, okay, can I help? Uh, I know a couple things about cars. Can I, like, stop the wipers for you? 
And so I, you know, I, she's, yeah, so you, yeah, go ahead, please. And so I do that, and I say, okay, like, try not de-escalate the situation. And here we are in the middle of the road, and just trying to calm down, soothing voice, right? I know how to do this, right? I have toddlers, soothing voice. And so uh, as we're talking, right over the road, over the hill comes a Sheboygan County Sheriff. Perfect, right? So as uh, her back's to him as he's driving this way, and I can see him, and I'm just like, all right, see me, see me, see me, make eye contact, stick my hand out, and he just drives on by. <laughs> the lady, yeah, typical share. Thank you, uh, thank you. The lady now sees that I was trying to get the attention of a Sheboygan County Sheriff, says, the edible I just took a couple minutes ago is kicking in, I'm okay. Gets in her car and leaves. And I'm standing in the middle of the road with a perfect illustration on mental health. That's all I had. I was confused as all get out what just took place. I was just lost. But this is what mental health is. It's just roundabout intersection of just the most confusing things. Because the things you can re- think you can rely on, I'm like, oh, good, sh- you can't rely on. Uh, and there's this unpredictable patterns and things, and all of a sudden, it'll go away, and it feels like it just appeared out of nowhere. And it's just crazy. You know, put up the picture of a roundabout. It's what it looks like. Uh, mental health looks like this intersection of a bunch of stuff coming together because it has to do with your physical brain, uh, all the things that make us human. So your heart, mind, soul, uh, there's emotions tied in there. There's uh, your family dynamics, the culture you come from. Think about all the intersections that take place, like all the roads, all those different things. They come together in one giant thing. And what mental health is, uh, when people have, I'll I'll call it uh, mental health crisis or bad mental health, is when a giant car accident, traffic, ga- traffic jam or something takes place and the whole thing starts going wonky. And that is like my best picture I can give you of what mental health is. And when mental health is going well, it's when all the traffic is flowing nice and even and, and everything's taking place and you're not questioning why you're in the middle of the road. Like that is, uh, that is what mental, mental health is. And so uh, the challenge for us then as a believer, as, as we look at God's word, is what does God's word say about that? Because God's word doesn't specifically use the words mental health. But does God's word give us language and tools to talk about that intersection? You bet it does. And so I want to show you uh, this morning a couple of pieces of where God's word talks about that intersection. Uh, the first uh, uh, spot I want to start is in Romans. You want to pull up uh, Romans 8, uh, 5 through 6. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. The book of Romans is just a masterpiece on theology. It's got rich teaching. The Apostle Paul has got such amazing things he has put in there. And he uses words uh, that help us understand what's going on inside of us. Uh, Set your minds. And so he's giving us language already on, we can put our, set our mind on the things of the flesh, or we can set our mind on the things of the spirit. And it's like, uh, death and life. It's a war. And the, the, the Apostle Paul can give us language and words in this space. And so some of our mental health challenges is looking at, man, the Apostle Paul in a lot of the epistles, not just in Romans, that he writes, give us language and words and tools to understand that intersection, that space. And so you will find the teachings of Scripture speak to it. You will find in the uh, teachings of Paul, especially in Jesus, oh my word, Jesus has so many teachings that speak to that intersection, uh, that he gives it different languages and he tells different stories and different parables that speak to it. You will read through it and you'll find the teachings of scripture speak to it. Uh, but that's not the only other place you will find it. Uh, if we go to uh, Psalm uh, 51.10, uh, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit 
within me. This was written by David. Psalm 51 uh, is the psalm he wrote right after um, a major sin in his life. Murdered a guy, um, committed adultery, just like lied, like pretty ugly, bad stuff. And in David's repentance, uh, as David is processing this and asking God for forgiveness, right in the middle of this, he writes this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because David knew uh, that sin, that choice he made, wasn't just like something out there. It didn't just come out of nowhere from over, over and out there. He, no, it's, he's like, oh, that came from in here. That came from something deep inside of me. And that if I'm going to walk with what the Lord has for me, if I'm going to turn back to God, I need God to be the one who makes this clean who makes my heart clean. Uh, and even in some of our cultural uh, differences, we don't quite understand even some of the, what he's getting at, because heart means something different in Hebrew than it does in English. Uh, in our culture, we say what heart is more related to, what would you guys agree to, like our feelings. Um, you know, I hear moms talk about when their kid does something cute, oh, my heart mom is so full. And I, I, I don't know, I just heard that done before. I just, uh, just <laughs> laughing at it, because it's true, right? So we relate that more to our feelings. Uh, but in Hebrew culture, they relate like to heart more to mind, uh, more to your conscience. And so he said, man, create in me clean thoughts, Lord. And that right spirit, that has to do a little bit more with the feelings. That has to do a little bit more with the what makes you do what you do, what gives you that maybe chutzpah to get up in the morning, that fire. And he's like, I don't want... The, my motivation to be wrong, Lord. So would you give me a right motivation? And I don't want dirty thoughts, Lord. I want clean thoughts, Lord. And this is just one psalm out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds we can look at. And what you begin to see is that the prayers of Scripture teach us how to pray when it comes to mental health. That the prayers of Scripture will teach us how to do that. One of my favorite prayers to tell people to read is Psalm 88. Does anybody know what Psalm 88 is about? Yes, all right, apparently I've taught so many of you guys on this. Psalm 88 is this psalm that's just like, you've left me in the pit to die. And it ends with, darkness is my only friend. And I'm like, yeah, that's the stuff right there. You know, you thought Simon and Garfunkel were the you know, original, you know, hello, darkness, my old friend. No, no, okay. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that he get, they got that out of Scripture. They got that out of the Psalms. Psalm 88 is just like, Lord, you have like left me to die. You have abandoned. It's just like gives us language and words of like those moments, those dark spaces in your life where you're just like, this is it. I'm done. How do I talk to my God about this stuff? Well, go to Psalm 88. It's got you. It'll give you some language, some words. It will teach you how to pray when you are in the pit of despair. When you're in uh, the thick of it, when you're in a dark, dark place, there's prayers for everything in Psalms. It will teach you how to pray that. Uh, so it's, not, it's in his teaching, it's in his prayers, and his songs of worship, uh, but it shows up somewhere else. Uh, last week, we were in 1 Kings, uh, if you want to pull that verse up. Uh, last week, we finished up the teaching series, uh, Expectant, and we're looking at the life and the story of Elijah um, and we were wrapping up how the story kind of ends. You want to pull up uh, 1 Kings 19? And um, it says he came to uh, out, sit underneath a broom tree and asked that he might die. Now, I don't know if you guys, you know, as we look back on the life of Elijah, uh, Elijah, uh, if I can say this, uh, had big cojones. He was a man of passion and fire. This dude was aggressive. He was like, man, it's not going to rain until I say so, walking into an evil king's court. Like, who, who does that? Who's like that audacious? Uh, he's just like a manly man. Like, man, I think, man, this dude's got, he took on like the prophets uh, of Baal and like some showdown. Like, it was like, this dude knows what's up. That's not typically a guy we think has mental health crises. And so it's interesting, when we read a story like that, it's really easy for us to go, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, Lord, take my life away from me, for I am no better than my father's. And it's a very, 
you can read that with a very melatone, very, I'm like a narrator kind of voice in a soft and gentle. But if you think of that guy who took on uh, the prophets of Baal, who walked around with the confidence that his God was that big, what do you think that sounded like? Just like, all right, Lord, I'm kind of done. Or do you think he had agony in his voice? And what does agony sound like coming out of somebody? And when you begin to read scripture and you begin to look at it through a lens sometimes of mental health, you can go, man, I think he was having a mental health crisis. And Pastor Joel did such a good job last week talking through uh, Elijah being disappointed but also disillusioned with God. And he's in a space where he's really broken. And what you'll begin to see is all the stories of scripture speak to mental health. And so you can find what God does in response if you realize he's having a mental health crisis. If you kept reading in Kings, uh, God has him take a nap. If you want like a master class on how to walk someone through a mental health crisis, God actually shows you in the story what to do. It's pretty cool. Here's why that's really, really important for us. Several weeks ago now, uh, after church, how many guys noticed some emergency vehicles on the bridge? A couple, couple of hands. Um, how many know what actually happened? Okay. For those who don't know what happened uh, that Sunday morning, uh, a guy jumped. He was done. He kind of looked like Elijah sitting underneath that broom tree. And that kind of wrecks me. Not, I'm not saying that to make anyone, like, like we miss something, like it's a guilty feeling, but it wrecks me because I go, Lord, was he that broken? And did he just need someone to walk him through potentially a mental health crisis? And a couple hundred feet away from where, we're, from where we are sitting, that's what took place, that battle. And then we got to wrestle with, man, if we want to be at church, who's not a hearer of the word, but doers of the word? Are we ready to wrestle with? What does it look like to walk with someone who's sitting down saying, I'm done? And you will find that God will say, I got you. I will show you what that looks like. And you will walk with my strength and my love. And I will guide you on how to do it. But we gotta listen for what God's teaching us in those stories and in those spaces. Because that's, that's tough. That's hard work. So if you want to engage uh, with Scripture uh, on mental health, turns out you need to engage with all of Scripture holistically in understanding what's going on if we're going to wrestle out with what God says about mental health. Is that impossible? I would say no. Is it hard work? Well, I would say yeah. That's, a, that's really hard work. I feel like I've been uh, s- wrestling with this only for the last couple years of my life, and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface on what God is saying. But God has so much to teach us. He's got so much to say to us on these things if we're willing to look at it, if we're willing to let God's word come and wrestle us and win. It's going to be powerful and potent. So if we're going to start a wrestling match with God, we've got to <laughs> anchor ourselves into some things. And um, when, uh, uh, when you start building, how, what is God saying? We've we got to go back on some foundational truth. And, we all, and for me, we always, and I guess as a church, we always got to go back to Genesis 1.1, which says, in the beginning, God. And you can stop right there. Because when you take all these different topics we're going to go with the next couple of weeks, whether this is mental health, same-sex attraction, abortion, like all these war- things, it's like really messy and complicated. And we're like, you're like, I can't make sense of this thing. And so you've got to go back to, in the journey, as you wrestle out, what is God saying to this? You've got to go back to, in the beginning, God. That in putting it in the context, that our God is big enough to handle the complexity. Our God is big enough to handle the mess. That our God is big enough to walk us through that, and he gives us grace to do that. So we got to put in the context, in the beginning, God, when this doesn't make sense, 
with what I'm looking at, I got to go back to in the beginning, God, and I got to stand on that truth if we're going to wrestle with what God is saying to us. The other place we got to wrestle with is what he says later in Genesis 1. Uh, if you want to put that up. After he created everything, and he, and he saw everything that he had made, and behold it, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth, and the sixth day. This is where wrestling, uh, when you're trying to make sense of something that's not easy to make sense of, you go back to what did God say about it? And that he said everything that he had made, and everything he created, everything God had made, he called it good. Very good. And so when you want to go, Lord, this doesn't make sense. How was this supposed to work? You go, well, God had goodness created in it. And that actually becomes our definition of healthy. That creation is good and living out the goodness God created. That's really where that starts. And so if we're looking at mental health, we got to wrestle with, this is actually something that God created he created the inside of who we are, our soul, our being, our heart, our mind, and he calls it good. But the challenge in the story becomes what happens in chapter 3 of Genesis. Satan, sin, evil, shame entered the picture. And so now creation, though is Though it was good, has now been corrupted, and the Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy it. And so, in the space of mental health, now uh, we have to try and wrestle out. Okay, this is what God intended for it, but here's how we're finding it. We have to now make sense of that, and it becomes a wrestling match. And the question for us becomes: Can we make creation good again? Can we put it back? I don't think so. I'm not a perfect holy God. I haven't lived a perfect life. I don't have that kind of power. And the good news, we don't have to. This is go to Romans. Because the good news in that, when we're looking at devastation and evil in the world, uh, this is what uh, Paul writes in Romans. It says, For the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God, in other words, the right living of God, the goodness that God created through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. There is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is our hope, man. If you need some encouragement in this kind of space, this is where I go and find it. That even though there is sin and darkness and shame and evil uh, battling in our mental health and in these different spaces, we don't have to fix it. Because Jesus has said, I got this. And Jesus humbled himself, uh, was born a baby, lived a perfect life, and then was betrayed and crucified and buried for three days. But then he rose again, defeating sin and death and starting the redemptive work. And that is the good news. And that is the, the invitation that he gives us to respond to. And so if you don't know Jesus as that savior, as that redemptive work in your life, come talk to me afterward. I want to share who this Jesus is with you. But that's where this goes back to when we have uh, this kind of hopelessness that we say we can't fix it. We cannot fix our, our mental health on our own. We cannot fix all the evil and brokenness on our own. I can't change the story but I can go back and say, Lord, would you create in me a clean heart? Would you know a right spirit? Would you be my uh, savior? Would you be the one who comes in and does your redemptive work in us and becomes powerful? And that becomes honestly our definition for the believer what mental health is. Because then mental health then becomes God's love, that redemptive work is now breaking into that, I guess, roundabout intersection of everything. And he's putting it back together the way he designed it to. And that is some really good news for us. And that is where the battle lies as we wrestle out what God is telling us about mental health is we are going to have to pay attention to where is God breaking in and putting in healing and re doing redeeming things in that space. And so if you're uh, walking through life and 
Uh, you're a human being who's got a body, mind, soul. You've got emotions. You have a personality. Uh, you come from a culture. You come from family dynamics. You have all these things that play inside your life. Um, mental health then becomes an every person thing, and it becomes, especially for us as believers, to pay attention to and what is God speaking to us in the middle of that. So if you wrestle with anything, uh, or uh, mental health has been something that you've been challenging, something that has, uh, something that has negatively impacted your life and that you kind of walk with, let the grace of God just wash over you right now. Give yourself um, maybe some slack, because it's hard. And uh, we're going to wrestle out uh, in a little bit here, some real life applications of mental health meeting us in our everyday walk because those things are extremely challenging and extremely painful. So give yourself some slack. And if you're walking with somebody who's in a mental health crisis, um, I don't want to give like just advice, but like the biggest thing to pay attention to is, man, what does God want to do here? Is this a space where we're going to see God break in and we're going to see his kingdom come. He's going to show us how big and how awesome and how great he is in this place. And it's going to be exciting to kind of watch. Um, but it's complicated. It's messy. It's nuanced. It's not simple. It's not easy. Just like that little can of beer has a lot of questions in it. It comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with a lot of stuff. So um, I'm going to give us a couple of stories um, and we don't have time to wrestle uh, them out fully, but I want to give you guys a couple of stories and analogies of why we need to know what Scripture says and why we need to know how to wrestle this out in real life application because it is so messy and complicated. Um, and that's how we're going to end today. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll end back. We'll go back to that verse of Second Corinthians and recognize this is some of the comfort God's given us. Um, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, to some Q and A uh, at the end. So, real world application of what God says about mental health meeting us in what we're walking with. Uh, this past fall, um, some dear friends of Amber and I uh, had a situation where uh, she was uh, this couple. They were um, seven months, about seven months pregnant, third trimester, right? It was Carly? Eight, okay. She had a seizure. She goes down, talking ambulance, emergency surgery. They're just trying to get the baby out. Um, and they get the baby out. It's alive, and they do all kind of tests and scans on her, and they find uh, a tumor inside of her brain. And so they operate on her head, and she's going through this deep process, and they were back uh, here. This is home for them. And we got to see them this Christmas, and uh, they're doing well uh, and I was sharing their story with us. And I asked the husband, did you notice something different about your wife? And he said, yes. He goes, I even told some friends, like this past year, I feel like part of my wife is missing because you can have a physical impact on your brain that can m impact your thought life and your mental health. And so where does God's grace and love and mercy for them in that space, how something physical can impact your thoughts. Uh, and that's, that shows up in a lot of different places. I know uh, a lot of moms have gone through uh, postpartum depression, um, and it's wild what we can learn about modern science. When a uh, mom is growing a baby inside of her, the nutrients that keeps your brain healthy and growing, uh, the, the mom's body will actually give the baby to grow their brain. And so actually, when a uh, woman is pregnant, their brain will actually start to shrink, and will, their, so the baby's brain will grow. And so that will throw off all kind of stuff and all kind of chemical balances and hormones. And so when, uh, after a baby is born, and now the brain is trying to recalibrate everything going on, it will throw moms into deep, deep depressions, and you go, well, where's God's love and grace, and what does God's word have to say about a space like that? And that's what I mean. We've got to wrestle this out. I was talking to uh, a counselor I was seeing, and he was telling me how powerful our senses are on the brain, how it leaves an impact. Um, he was telling me about a client he had that ended up in the fetal position five minutes into their a session. Uh, what had happened is 
Uh, he had a speaking engagement later that night, so he put on a nice suit and some cologne, he, very professional. He was going to meet with a couple of clients before he goes to this speaking engagement. Um, and after a couple minutes walking in, this lady had smelled that cologne, and it put her into a full panic attack where she had to go and like, just lost control. See, what happened in her life is she was sexually assaulted by a man wearing that exact same cologne. And what she was trying to figure out is why does every time I go to a concert randomly I have these deep panic attacks or if I'm at a business convention or something like that because she's like, I'm successful. I have all this really good stuff. I don't struggle with anxiety anywhere else, but I just get these panic attacks. And that smell is so powerful on her brain. It has a physical impact on it that when she smells that, her body goes into complete and total shock. Where's God's love and grace meeting her in that space. And so you can see um, there's all kind of medical definitions we can get into and what it means, uh, whether it's bipolar or something like that, that you can have physical imbalances and things on a brain that will affect your mental health. And, and so we got to wrestle that out. The other thing that does impact your mental health is what Paul wrote uh, in Romans, is sin. Uh, the biggest factor in my life that impacted my mental health is my addiction to pornography. Uh, when I was stressed or anxious, you just watch porn, instant uh, dopamine hit, fixes it, now my brain's addicted to this stuff. And uh, the part of your brain that when you watch porn is the same part of your brain that lights up when you do crack cocaine. So you, it, it, you can see physical damage to your brain if you're a porn addict, as you kind of do as you're on crack. So to say, all right, you should just stop watching porn, and be like, oh yeah, I can do that. I go, man, that's crazy. I don't know how you do that on your own strength without God walking you say through that piece of it. But sin has ramification, it has consequences. And so sometimes mental health battles are due to the fact that there is sin in someone's life and it's wrecking havoc on their thought process. Uh, and so where's God's love and grace and his words speaking to that person? Uh, and I want to be very careful on this next one because I don't want to give it too much hype. But I, it, it's, it's, it's what God's word says is true. It's why God tells us to put on the full armor of God is that uh, sometimes demonic like to play in that space. Uh, and they will, people in depression, it can come from a spiritual, form, a spiritual attack in people's lives and things. I don't want to overhype it that every time someone gets sad and depressed, it's a demon coming after them. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. Uh, but that is a spiritual spiritual element that often uh, medical professionals aren't looking for uh, or aren't paying attention to. And we have to discern uh, if someone's having a mental health crisis, what is going on in their life and what does the word of God say in trying to meet them? And so it's messy. That's a lot of, that, that's just some, you know, some stories I was thinking about to try and share with you what's going on. And so all those kind of things come into that little intersection and they collide with each other and we somehow are like, what do we do with this? And so this is why we got to know what the word of God says and we got to wrestle it out, uh, not just in your own life, but as a community and ask the question, how do we respond as a community to people inside of our church with mental health crises? How do we respond to people walking outside of these walls in a mental health crisis? In that space. But can we go to that uh, Second Corinthians verse? Here's what becomes really powerful about this. Is, uh, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, in our mental health crises. This is where God will comfort us. And so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. And for as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in the comfort too. And if, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope is for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort when you walk through the different mental health spaces in your life, God will not only comfort you in that space, he will use that space for his glory and comfort others in the spaces they walk in. And it becomes really powerful and really cool. And I kind of get excited then about mental health cra you know, crises, not because I'm you know, like a crazy person like seeing people suffer. I actually get excited about a mental health crisis 
because I go, I'm going to see God work. I'm going to see God move. And that's like the coolest thing ever. And I'm excited to see what God wants to do in this place and in this moment. And that is where I find my encouragement. And that's where I find my hope. And that's where I see God to work the most. So um, I'm just going to pray a blessing over you guys. Uh, if you have kids in kids ministry, uh, please go get them. Uh, don't leave them, you know, checked in there. Uh, let the kids workers be able to come out. Uh, but I want to open it up for some Q&A. We covered a lot of ground really fast. And if this is something we're going to wrestle out, then we need a space to do that. And so we're just going to take a handful of minutes uh, after, after this. If you can stick around, awesome. If you can't, you got something to go to, no problem. Um, but let's be people who look at the Word of God and examine it, paying attention to those blind spots, uh, and uh, be doers then of the Word, not just hearers of it. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, you're the God who understands the most complex and messy things. And you're the God who looks at your creation and says it's very good. And so, Lord, uh, would you give us eyes to see how you see things? Would you give us um, grace and mercy in the spaces we need it? And would you teach us to be a church who walks uh, in the spaces uh, that are full of pain, that are full of confusion, that are full of hurt? Uh, but we walk in that space with confidence in what your word says and in who you are, Lord, uh, that we may uh, be that city on a hill, that we may be the light in the darkness, showing people uh, your love. And Lord, we desperately know this is a community that needs your love. This is a de community that's desperate for uh, your kingdom to come and to impact, uh, and to, to impact it, Lord. And so we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.